Welcome to America's Heroes Group. Welcome to America's Heroes Group Roundtable with Women Have a Voice and me, Deborah Denhart. Today is Saturday, January 21st, 2023. January is Cervical Cancer Awareness and National Blood Donor Month. Our host is Cliff Kelly. I'm your co-host today, Deborah Denhart. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith. And our digital media producer, Ivan, is Ivan Ortega's Scouts Honor Productions. Today, we on our panel is Jennifer Ruth Green. Jennifer Ruth Green is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and a combat veteran of Iraqi freedom. She's the founder of Mission Aero Pipeline, a nonprofit providing aerospace and STEM training to underrepresented youth, and is currently an instructor pilot, as well as serves as a lieutenant colonel in the Indiana Air National Guard. Jennifer, Ruth, thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's really an honor to have you here, and I, I, I'm just so excited to, to let's talk more about you. Can you tell me more about growing up and how your past has influenced uh, who you are today? Absolutely. So I uh, am a military brat, a third generation combat veteran. Um, I was, I'm a baby of six and both my grandfathers and my father served in uh, the military. My grandfather served in World War II, both of them. And then my father served in combat in Vietnam. And as you mentioned, I served in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, my mom is a trained nurse and uh, she's Filipino. And my dad's African-American, and so I grew up in a, a biracial home. Uh, again, the baby of six, four boys, two girls, and truly do love my family. Uh, we grew up in a Christian household, and we grew up with a strong requirement for discipline and uh, essentially a strong sense of the requirement that we had to own uh, our our actions and be responsible for our future. So um, that was kind of embedded into every decision that we made and the conversations around our decisions kind of focused on thinking long-term and making sure that we were doing right in accordance with values, biblical values, but also in obedience to, um, you know, what we were supposed to be doing as, as young people preparing for our future. That's great. So that's a, that's a big family. That's, that's awesome. I love yes. it. <laughs> I love that. Now, you're an Air Force combat um, veteran serving, like we talked about, in Iraqi Freedom. Can you tell me about your role in your military service? Uh, so my military service actually started at 18 when I went to the United States Air Force Academy. And after graduating from there, I started off flying uh, in pilot training for a couple of years and then transitioned and became uh, a federal agent with the wow. Air Force Office of Special Investigations. So my deployed time in Operation Iraqi Freedom was as a mission commander in combat. Mm -hmm. And uh, the training that I received was to vet and recruit spies. And while we were there, uh, mm -hmm. I began to understand the human cost of war, but also uh, the realities of what um, conflict means and how we as people engage and interact as military members uh, on a large scale with the rest of the world. And so it was just an, an intense time. And I will say publicly that war is an ugly thing, mm -hmm. the ugliest thing I've ever been a part of. Uh, and there's nothing amazing, beautiful, exciting about it. It is a responsibility and uh, it is work to be able to complete objectives to serve ideally the greater good of our nation and the greater good of people around the world. And so being willing to do that um, is something that I don't take lightly. And the responsibility as well is something I don't take lightly. But um, there, there definitely is a sense of camaraderie in combat. And uh, you get the chance to work with people that you really would be willing to give your life for. So you make some lifelong friends and deep connections. And so it's just a very, very unique experience. But uh, that was combat, and um, that was essentially the requirement during Operation Iraqi Freedom. That's great. And you also have a piloting background. Can you share a little bit about that? Yes. So my aviation background is a, uh, a sense of um, excitement and then failure and then growth and and it was a journey. Um, so I, I earned my private pilot's license at the Air Force Academy. I'd been selected to become an Air Force pilot. And so I went to Air Force pilot training. And I was there for uh, about 48, 49 weeks in training. And you graduate uh, at 52 weeks. And so actually, I was six weeks away from earning my pilot wings. 
And uh, I was struggling. Mm -hmm. Uh, Every day I would get up and I would study and I would put in work and I would try hard, uh, but it just didn't come naturally to me. Mm -hmm. And so eventually there came a point where the Air Force uh, leadership said, hey, we just feel like you lack aeronautical decision making. And basically that was, you will do what we tell you to do, but when it comes to you making the decision about what needs to happen next, you're just not as quick as we need you to be. And so uh, coming from the Air Force Academy, graduating as a lieutenant and having the opportunity to fly uh, for this long, I was looking forward to a goal, but I completely understood what, you know, my, my leadership was saying. And so I was disappointed and discouraged, and actually that's when I uh, applied to and became a, a special agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. But um, in 2015, fast forward, um, it had been about, let's say, eight or nine years. I hadn't flown a lot um, because I was busy doing other things, but I said, let me try to see if I can pick up aviation again. And so I started flying just a little bit, but in 2015, I was uh, at a in a missions conference down in Brazil on a missions trip. And there were some people that encouraged me uh, to pick up flying. They said, Hey, you have a pilot's license and uh, we're here and need to travel up and down the Amazon. There's one plane and there's one pilot. And if either of those things are down, then we don't have the capacity to uh, do our job in reaching people, you know, with the gospel. And so it really just kind of spurred me to say, hey, how can I help solve the problem that I see? And so I went back and, and uh, started an aeronautics degree and started training and preparing and earning aviation ratings. So I finished that degree in aeronautics and then became a certified flight instructor. And I said, you know, I want to develop and serve missionaries through aviation. I also have a heart for underrepresented young people. And so I want to make sure that we can combine those two. So we started a nonprofit to develop and serve missionaries through aviation and primarily target, um, you know, underrepresented young people as the people that we train um, with our STEM curriculum. So we're very excited about that. And uh, I'm encouraged by the opportunity to do something that I appreciate and get back into aviation because uh, now that it makes sense, Mm -hmm. um, it is such a joy and it feels so free in the air for sure. You know, that's amazing. I, I think it's so, it takes such courage to go back to something. You know, I think as women, sometimes mm-hmm. we're like, we fail and then we're like, oh, well, I'm never trying that again. Right. You know, it's kind of like we just <laughs> yes. have these expectations that we're going to get it maybe the first time, second time. After a few times, you're kind of like, uh, I think I'm hanging that in, you know, but you went back and got it. You know, you said, OK, I'm yes. going to do it again. And that that takes courage to do that. So that's um, I salute you on that. That's great. Well, thank so, you. Did you do you feel like you faced any obstacles being a woman in the military during your service? You know, I, I went to a school where 80% of the population was men. Mm-hmm. And so we were a part of a small population. And the first class of women um, graduated in 1980. And so they faced a lot of uh, a lot of opposition being in service academies because they were previously all male. And uh, the congressional authorization to allow women to serve and then and come in in the class of 1980 was was very, um, very impactful. But they went through it a lot and I got the chance to stand on their shoulders. And so personally, I didn't see any specific things where I personally had trouble. Um, But I think there were some things that were quite unique as far as experiences go, but nothing uh, insurmountable. But first, let me talk about some of the things that I saw. Uh, I've seen from, you know, people who came before me, Um, you know, thinking through the aviation situation uh, in long flights and fighter jets um, and by long couple of hours, uh, there were previously not women um, combat fighter pilots. And so fighter pilots, period, or combat fighter pilots. And so in the aircraft during those long sorties, people would, uh, men would use the restroom and relieve themselves through what they would call uh, a piddle pack. And it was a pack that you would sit down and relieve yourself in. Well, it was based on the male anatomy. And so there was a point where people had to contend and and speak up to, to Air Force leadership and say, hey, we don't have an opportunity for us to use this tool because it's not designed for our bodies. Right. And so there were things like that where people didn't have the, the, the resources they needed to be able to accommodate 
uh, the mission or mm-hmm. accomplishing the mission. Um, usually women would dehydrate themselves or they would, you know, go to the bathroom after they got out or whatever it was. And so um, there just had to be accommodations that were made, but it was just things that necessarily weren't included, mm-hmm. um, whether it was changed, you know, even uh, today, thinking through the fact that in military squadrons, people are building today um, pumping rooms for women to serve in the military. And so that's just not something that was, necessary before because people didn't think through it but now that women are a steady stable part of our fighting force uh, it's an opportunity for um, our military to continue to grow into uh, not only accommodating but continuing to embrace the needs that we as women have while serving in the ranks and so um, just some unique experiences Mm -hmm. um, that people have fought for because people were unaware of things I um, you know small experience for me in combat um, I was a senior ranking officer and the mission commander as we would go out on missions and meet with our counterparts, the Iraqis. And I found that oftentimes um, our male Iraqi counterparts would, or sources, would ask questions and communicate, uh, making eye contact to the men in the group, asking them what we wanted to do, where we were going to go, what decisions we would make. And culturally, that was normal for them. But uh, as the leader, um, you know, I was the one making the decisions. And so the men in the, in our, in our, um, in our convoy would turn to me and ask the question and uh, I would answer. And then, uh, then the interpreter would ask, you know, or respond to our counterpart, and then they would turn around and ask a man again. And so it was just so simple things like that that were cultural, but nothing where I felt that it was insurmountable or intentional. Um, that was cultural, specifically in Iraq, but nothing that, um, you know, impeded my ability to serve. That's great. And that's, you know, something that has come up a lot, you know, as far as like women or men, you know, only pay attention and paying, paying attention to other men, assuming they're the leaders, you know, um, in, a, in a situation, especially a pilot. Right. Or, you know, or, or, you know, in your position that you were serving, um, thinking sure. that, oh, you know, I actually the woman is in charge, you know, so um, <laughs> that's, that's so true that that happens. Um, even with doctors, you know, not being referred to as doctor um, because yes. they're a woman, but misses. Um, so that, that mm-hmm. has come up you mm-hmm. know, in conversations before. So and you experienced that yourself. Now, you've done some amazing things, you know, with the underrepresented children of the, you know, the youth. And I just think that's so amazing. And you have so many hands in the pot, you know, instructor pilot. Now I'm really impressed that you, in all of those things that you have your hands in, you ran for Congress last fall. So (laughs) what motivated you to run for Congress? Yes. So we spent the last uh, 18 months of the 2022-2021 calendar years competing for the opportunity to serve in the the 118th class of Congress. And um, it was a very unique experience, but driven by um, this need to, to take care of our country. Um, I remember February 4th, 2020, when I saw the state of the union address, when president Trump uh, was speaking and behind him was speaker of the house, Nancy Pelosi. And uh, it was, it was not um, hidden that the two of them didn't get along. And so on a national stage though, on one of the biggest nights where uh, our country is conveying to the world what we plan to do, the commander in chief's intent, uh, ultimately the state of our nation and where we're going, all of those things being public, uh, the number one and number three in our country are, are having this passive aggressive battle, standing, not standing, clapping, not clapping, those kinds of things. But ultimately at the end of his speech, Speaker Pelosi tore up the State of the Union address. And not only did she tear it up once, but she tore it up four times. And I remember seeing that, and I remember feeling a a visceral feeling in my stomach. And I remember thinking, wow, this this is harmful. This is terrible from our leadership. Um, And thinking to, you know, to my role at, at that time, I was serving as a military commander of a communications flight at the 122nd Fighter Wing. And I had deployed people to combat. I had redeployed people. And it was the responsibility. It was the gravity and the weight of it was something that was not lost on me. And so looking at that situation, I said, wow, as a leader, it is my responsibility to convey uh, truth and transparency, but also to convey strength and viability. 
and connectivity. And right now, the leadership of our country is conveying weakness. And right now, they're conveying instability. And I thought about it. I said, you know what? Tomorrow, there are going to be headlines. Tomorrow, uh, people are going to stand up and say, thank you, Speaker Pelosi. Thank you for what you've done. And this wasn't about Republicans or Democrats or President Trump and whether or not he was, you know, the, the disagreements that she had with him uh, were, was right or wrong. But the reality is, as leaders, we are accountable and responsible for our action. And leaders on a national stage have to understand that they are conveying information to our enemies and our adversaries. And if our enemies and our adversaries believe that we're a house divided, if they believe that we are not ready to combat the challenges or to stand firm with the direction that the president has provided, then they see a house that's divided. House divided cannot stand. And and, uh, it made me think, you know what? It's very easy for politicians to stand up and say, hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get applause and people are going to give me money and people are going to say job well done and pat me on the back. But at the end of the day, if our enemies decide that we're weak and they decide to plan an attack, my life is on the line and the lives, the lives of military members, uh, my brothers and sisters in arms, we are going to be the ones that are accountable and responsible for responding to these attacks. And so it's fine to sit in your up-armored SUV and roll around Washington, D.C. and have a security team, but I am responsible for keeping the country safe, and it's your responsibility to convey strength. And the Constitution says that the legislative body is the body that's intended to declare war. And so I thought about it. I said, you know what, if you understood If people in Washington understood the human cost of war, they would be a lot more careful with their actions. They would be a lot more careful with their conduct. And we need people who understand the human cost of war. And I saw that 19 percent of congressional members had served in the military. And I don't know what ratio of uh, or what the number percentage of those 19 percent are people who have served in combat. But at the end of the day, that number has decreased because during the Vietnam era, we had many more veterans who served. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, I just said, we need people who are ready to stand up and take care of our country and respect the responsibilities because we have a task to take care of. And one of those major tasks is taking care of being leaders and conveying confidence in uh, our country and keeping our military safe. And you stood up to that and you said, I'm going to do something. And that's that's awesome. I love that. I love that. Yes, it took courage to do that. And Thank you. Did. you. Um, now, what obstacles do you feel like you faced during the campaign? It wasn't an easy ride, right? I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure there were some bumps in the road. Can you share some of those uh, bumps that you faced oh. and how you overcame them? Well, I think campaign life in and of itself is something that's very unique. Um, I was very fortunate to have solid friends who believed in the same mission that I believed in, uh, prayer partners who were willing to pray with and for me that I would have personal strength and strength of character Mm -hmm. to be able to execute what I said um, I stood for. And I I think that was very impactful and helpful as a foundation and a strong family that was dedicated to helping me as well. So all of those things were, were, were very helpful. Um, But there were some unique obstacles. Um, For example, um, the Air Force leaked my my records, my entire military record in unredacted form uh, to opposition research firm who was researching on behalf of of my opponent. And so um, they got a hold of my records. And unfortunately, in my record is the reality that I'm a a survivor of sexual assault in the military, uh, military sexual trauma. And resultantly, um, they took those records and they took that fact and they gave it to the media and they fished it around and farmed it to multiple media outlets. And there was a media outlet that published that. And so, you know, the, the, one of the worst days of my life became public fodder for the nation. And, uh, and it was instigated by opposition Uh, in the middle of a political campaign. And the fact that 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 happened was was a huge obstacle, not only um, when you think about mental health and trying to stand up to the realities that you're reliving the difficulties of that day, um, a a day where you told somebody, you know, no, please stop. This is not acceptable. Don't do this. And, uh, And they decided to do it anyway. And now here you have somebody else who says, we're going to publish this. And you say, no, please stop, don't. Mm -hmm. 
and they decide to do it again and they do it anyway. And uh, it was it was a reliving those things. That was a very difficult time. Um, and, uh, you know, things are still ongoing, um, but we have the facts out and, and it's a, a real situation. But the reality is um, the 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 depravity of, of mankind in the midst of the situation when fighting for power, fighting to preserve power um, or seeing and meeting people that when you want to connect with them and you your intent on integrity and building these relationships that are embedded in trust and, and trying to really move the ball forward as far as taking care of our country. And, and you find that people are transactional in their, um, you know, opportunity or not opportunities in their connections. Um, those things I think are things that are um, difficult to, to, to wrap my mind around because I've been in a team environment where people are focused on how do we make things better collectively? Mm-hmm. And uh, the political environment was one that was uh, not set up for that. And so that was unique to me. Mm-hmm. And I think um, as God continues to grow me and help me uh, and help me recover, um, those are some of the obstacles that we face. But I find and found that meeting with people, connecting with people, sharing the vision and uh, helping people to, to see what we could be doing and what better looks like. Um, I enjoy that, appreciate that, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to have 18 months to spend time with the greatest people in America uh, who live in Northwest Indiana. There's a lot of, of things that have to happen, you know, like coming together a community, you know, that's, that's what brings us, you know, we can't do it on our own, right? We need other people. We have about a minute Absolutely. left. Yeah, we have about a minute left, Jennifer Ruth. Do you have any final thoughts? You like to share? You know, I, I did want to share. There is a quote that I really love. And um, when we're talking about having a voice and we're talking about moving forward and pressing forward, a, a quote that I love uh, from my friend Chris Campbell, a captain in the Air Force, said, there's no point in blazing a trail if the trail doesn't become a road. And uh, if we are going to have a voice, we're, we should use our voice, but we should also make sure that we are providing a hand back to help people uh, to move forward Thank and you. blaze the trail, but build the road while doing it. Thank you so much, Jennifer Ruth. Stay tuned to America's Heroes Absolutely. Group. We'll be right back.